Good evening, this is What's Going On. I'm John Lee. Our guest this evening is Will Arnold, a candidate for the Davis City Council. Will, I want to thank you for being on our show. Thank you for having me, John. Pleasure to be here. Good. It's my pleasure to have you. Um, there, are, there are two big elephants in the room with you as a candidate for the Davis City Council. And normally what I do in the show is the first half of the show is about where do you come from and the second half is about where are you going. We're going to get to that, but I want to take care of the two elephants first in terms of who Will Arnold is. You know Will Arnold, and it's because of these two elephants. The second reason is because he's got a physical handicap, and I want to start out with your physical handicap. Sure. So welcome to my show. Thank you. So you've turned this into a campaign slogan. Just reach out your hand, John. Well, what do you mean by that? So. Uh, when folks are faced with shaking my hand for the first time, and I mention this in my campaign kickoff speech, I get a range of responses, anything from um, people just not knowing what to do all the way to grabbing me by the shoulder or doing a modified fist bump or something. And if I could tell folks what to do, uh, it would be just reach out your hand. That makes it easy for me to shake your hand. Um, and I told that story to a couple of people, and, and uh, they thought it was a pretty apt metaphor for my candidacy for city council. So it's, it's, uh, it's become somewhat of a, a slogan of mine. So you've had to live with this your whole life. Sure. Yeah. So when you were a little kid running around the rec pool at UCD, everybody knew sure. who you were no doubt. just because you were the kid without any arms. Yeah. In fact, I, I kind of count myself lucky in that regard. Um, there's, uh, um, you know, folks with disabilities uh, run the, the gamut of, of, there's all kinds of disabilities, all shapes and sizes, uh, levels of severity, et cetera. Um, but one way to, to sort of uh, categorize, if you will, uh, folks with disabilities is, is, is people who were born with their disability or, or people who acquired them. And frankly, I've always considered myself somewhat lucky, if you can say that, uh, that I don't know any different. So um, my entire life, every t the first time I ever picked something up, the first time I ever uh, fell over, the, it was all with the body that I have now. And so I don't know what it's, I, would, I wouldn't know what it's like to have a full set of arms. So what's it look like when you drive a car? Uh, I'm pretty close up to the steering wheel uh, and um, uh, probably a lot of me leaning forward and leaning backward. Uh, um, I'm uh, a little bit limited as to which kinds of cars I can drive. They've got to have a lot of headroom so that I, because I'm a pretty tall guy and, uh, and so I've got to be able to lean forward and uh, so probably, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, Lamborghini, uh, you know, it, it's beyond just economic reasons that I'll never drive a Lamborghini because my head would hit the, uh, hit the windshield. But uh, um, the only small car I've ever driven is a Volkswagen Beetle, one of the new Beetles. And uh, those have, of course, a ton of headroom. And I loved that because I, I for the first time ever, uh, got to zip around in a tiny car. But mostly it's, uh, it's bigger cars. I had a pickup truck when I was a kid. And I mostly drive my Honda Pilot now, and so they got to have a lot of headroom. So test driving a car is very important to me. Um, and uh, I used to um, utilize a modification of uh, a pretty minor modification where I had something uh, strapped to the bottom of the steering wheel. It was just sort of a, it started out as a knob, but really we ended up just putting a little uh, maybe four inch metal bar uh, out there that I used. And then one time, uh, um, it started to wear down. I, you do put a lot of torque on it. And, and uh, it was about to break, so I took it off. And then I had to drive, and I said, this is easier. I like it better with just the steering wheel. Uh, <laughs> so ever since then, I've just used the steering wheel. And so the, the only other modifications I have for my car, um, uh, I have to wear my glasses, obviously, or, or contacts, I suppose. Um, uh, it needs to have a blinker that's working because I can't do the hand signals, and it has to be an automatic for uh, for obvious reasons. That's incredible. 
So um, I tried to drive a stick once um, with a friend. Uh, she was doing the shifting of the gears, and I was, but obviously still, I was stalling out and stuff. I mean, I didn't even, even know the basics, but, um, but no, it, it should be an automatic. Okay, um, I've seen you do a lot of electronics work with your toes. Sure. So talk about how you use your toes the way most people use their fingers. Sure. Um, so I still, um, I mean, I use my toes for a lot of things. I find myself gesturing with my feet a lot when I'm when I'm in a conversation. Um, do, but, do people pick that up? Uh, yeah, sometimes. Obviously, it depends on the venue and uh, my comfort level. But uh, um, but I uh, sometimes it's easier for me to grab things with my feet or manipulate certain types of objects with my feet. Um, the best example, an early example, was uh, 1985 when the Nintendo Entertainment System came out and of course a watershed moment for any child of the 80s like I am. And uh, my friend uh, got a Nintendo uh, for Christmas and uh, I started playing it, trying to play it with my hands and it was a little bit awkward and I kind of tried different, you know, ways of doing it. And then I said, I'm just going to give it a go with my feet. Put the controller on the floor and 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 play with my feet and it worked and I was good and I ha and I just yesterday was playing Mario Kart with uh, my wife uh, and was playing with my feet and of course I won all the <laughs> races and uh, <laughs> uh, so that's how I and, and that's a little trivial example obviously it's not you know important so let's talk about an day, important but, example what sure. about the Rubik's Cube ah yeah one of my claims to fame is that I am a former world record holder. Uh, if you go, in fact, to, I believe it's speedcubing.net, which is the uh, official web uh, database of world records for the Rubik's Cube, uh, I'm still on there. No longer a world record holder, but, I'm, but it shows past world record holders. But uh, I used to have the world record for the fastest person to solve the Rubik's Cube with his feet. Uh, it's actually somebody actually beat you. My record's been shattered, in <laughs> fact, by some Europeans. I think I threw down the gauntlet, and uh, and now the record is. <laughs> so uh, I'll I'll share that story very quickly. Um, I learned to solve the Rubik's cube. It's it's like any game, including video games, where there's a level one that's kind of easy, and the levels get progressively harder until you're at the last level where you're solving for the last little bits of the cube, and it's a pretty intense uh, algorithm that you're using and so but somebody taught me to to solve the Rubik's Cube and once again it was clear to me that this was going to be far easier to do with my feet um, and so I would solve it and it's a fun thing to do while you're sitting and watching television or something to solve it and then mess it up again and solve it and uh, um, I happened to be on the internet looking and I saw a picture of an elephant with a paintbrush in its trunk which of course I had to click on, right? Uh, and it, it turns out it was the Guinness world record for the most expensive piece of artwork ever created by an animal. Um, and uh, fa fantastic, that linked me to the uh, Guinness Book of World Records website, uh, which had certain uh, records, including the Rubik's Cube. And it said, you know, here's the fastest, you know, person solving it with their hands. And they said for more, records, uh, uh, check out speedcubing.net. I went to that website uh, and found out that there was in fact a record for solving it uh, with your feet uh, and that that record at the time, this was about 2005, that that record was uh, around five minutes. It was a little bit over five minutes. And I said, you know, I think it takes me about five minutes to, to do this. I ought to check it out. So I set a little timer and I solved it in less than five minutes. And I said, well, that was a world record. I can't imagine it counts. Uh, so what do I do now that I think I can break a world record? And, and I found out that the way you do it is that there's official Rubik's Cube competi sanctioned competitions uh, and that there was one coming up later that year at Caltech. And, um, and so, uh, and in fact, it, it gave me the email address of the um, gentleman, Tyson, who was putting on the competition. 
and it was a Yahoo email address. And so I said, oh, I have Yahoo Messenger. I might as well open that up and send him a message. So I sent him a message saying, hey, Will Arnold, I'm from Davis. Um, I think I can break the world record, and I want to come to your competition. And of course, he was online at the time because he's a Caltech student. And he, uh, and he wrote me back and was very excited and said, oh my gosh, I need you to come down. This would be fantastic. You'd be a celebrity. And so the, the point of all that is that I went from, within about an hour, I went from seeing a picture of an elephant with a uh, paintbrush in its trunk to at least setting up my uh, trip that resulted in me uh, breaking this uh, Rubik's Cube world record. Uh, flew down to, uh, to Caltech. Um, made sure to get a pedicure the night before. One of, the, one of my proudest moments of forethought was, hey, people might be taking pictures of my feet. I ought to at least make them look presentable. Uh, and then uh, you get three bites at the apple, and my first solve was under five minutes, so that was a world record. And then I, I, my third and final one was uh, just over four minutes. 4.06.68 wow. was my record. Uh, the record in now is less than a minute. It's been destroyed, and I and I have sadly uh, um, relinquished your relinquished throne. my throne, and I uh, and it doesn't even. Uh, I've 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 become rusty on the on the Rubik's cube, and and uh, would love to, maybe someday, I'll I'll make a valiant comeback and and re-break that record, but uh, it'll take some work. Well. Between now and then, you have a few other things to work sure. on. Sure. So yeah. let's let's start with your family. Yeah. Um, your granddad had the Chevrolet station. Yeah. At, <clears throat> at that point, that was the best place to buy a car. Sure. Yeah, so my family uh, has been uh, um, multi-generational in the region. Uh, in 1906, the Arnold brothers uh, opened up the first car dealership in Sacramento. It was on 18th and Capitol, and if you go there, it's Zocalo Restaurant now, but if you go there, uh, even if you look it up uh, for Google Street View, you can see that still etched into the, to the top of the doorway is Arnold Brothers Motors. Um, and so f for generations, my family was in the car business. And it was in the 50s that, uh, that uh, my grandfather uh, thought that Davis would be a good place to open up a car dealership and, uh, and opened up uh, this dealership. I believe in 1958 is when they moved to town. Uh, so my dad at the time would have been, oh, probably about uh, 10 years old. And um, so that's when the family moved to Davis. So let's, uh, when I said there were two giant elephants in, in Will's life, Doug Arnold is the second one. Sure. I'll, I'll just give you one statistic. I believe it's 52% of the sales in real estate in Davis are Doug Arnold, Colwell Banker, real estate. Now, Doug Arnold has passed away, but Doug Arnold is still a tremendous presence in the real estate industry, That's especially great. in Davis. So sure. talk about your dad. Um, so my dad, um, he did pass away last year, um, and, but he um, was a real uh, fixture in the Davis community for his entire adult life. Uh, he grew up here from when he moved here at about 10 years old, uh, graduated from high school here. He was a Blue Devil class in 1965. Um, and uh, uh, aside from uh, four years that he spent in the early 70s as a police officer in San Francisco, uh, he spent his entire uh, life in Davis, and uh, um, it was in the in the late 70s, I believe 1978, that he and uh, my grandparents, his parents, uh, partnered together to start uh, Arnold Real Estate, and um, just a uh, small real estate company brokerage, which I think with I think just them and maybe one or two other agents, and. Uh, between then and and now, uh, they grew to be far and away the number one um, real estate uh, brokerage in the county. And um, it was uh, at the mid 80s, I believe 1986, that, uh, that, that Arnold Real Estate took on the Coldwell Banker franchise. And I'll remember that because uh, 
um, Arnold Real Estate colors were yellow, and and, uh, and uh, you know my dad around when he took on Coldwell Banker said, "What's your favorite color, Will?" And I said, "Well, yellow, of course, right?" And he said, "No, no, no, now it's blue." blue. So that blue. was that was the change. Uh, wow. Uh, and <laughs> um, uh, so he was uh, very successful uh, in business, and um, uh, he left a, a legacy in town that uh, that I'm very proud to to even be you know tangentially associated with. He um, uh, was the he his father, uh, he and then uh, my sister Carrie were all presidents of the Davis Chamber of Commerce uh, at various times. Three generations of Arnold's. Uh, he was uh, very uh, generous with both his time and his uh, and his resources and with the companies. Uh, uh, resources uh, all over town, but in particular the schools, uh, either the Davis Schools Foundation or the Blue and White Foundation, or or any individual, you know, the football boosters and all all kinds of things. Uh, he was uh, very uh, proud that he was able to be inducted into the Davis High School Hall of Fame in uh, 2014, which turned out to be only uh, about six months before he passed away. Um, so I was very, uh, I'm thrilled that he got to get that honor uh, in his lifetime, and it was well deserved. Certainly, uh, uh, very uh, proud of uh, not just what he did in Davis, certainly, but he was uh, uh, always the the leader and always the the boss, always the driver. If we were going on family vacations and uh, and. Uh, um, it's, a, it's one of the goals of my lifetime to live up to one-tenth of the man that he was. And a Giants fan. Oh, of course, yeah. Well, he uh, uh, was a Giants fan uh, as, a, as a kid, but then he was, uh, like I said, he was a cop in the 70s, and uh, Ingleside was his, uh, uh, Ingleside 17 was his call, uh, call sign. And uh, um, he also um, did some of the um, Giants games, did security for, for you know, for the Giants games, and so one of his claims to fame was that he saw Willie Mays naked in the locker room, which I, I not, think is not too many than a signature. Have, not yeah. many, not too many. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, he would, we would go to Giants game back, of course, when they were playing at Candlestick, uh, and you know there'd be a big line of cars on the freeway getting off at a at an exit, and he would get off about two exits ahead of everybody else, and we'd be going down these back streets in San Francisco, no sense that I had that you know, we were anywhere near the ballpark. And then he would turn a corner and bam, there we were. And we had jumped the line completely because he knew his way around the city. And, and that, was, that was always fun. I think San Francisco was always a, a second home to him. And, uh, and, and, and it's always felt that way uh, to me. Since then, uh, Giants fan, 49ers fan, and and just a love for that city that uh, that I try and pass on to my family. Well, thanks for that. Well, let's move on. But sure. you know, those those two elephants are sure. going to be part of the rest of the conversation yeah. as well. So, um, talk for a minute about growing up in Davis. Sure. So uh, I was uh, born at Woodland Memorial Hospital. Uh, came home to a house on Marina Circle, um, and um, you know, my dad uh, was very well known. Grew up in town, but also had this business. My mom uh, was a teacher in the Davis School District uh, for forty years. So you know, the old the old saying: it takes a village uh, to raise a child. I mean, for better or worse, this village raised me. Um, it was, um, uh, my babysitters were always students that my mom had. Um, the, the, the probably, certainly most famous pair of babysitters that I had, they would ba babysit me together, uh, were Franz and Mike. So that would be Franz Wisner and Michael Franti were my babysitters at once. And of course, Michael Franti is now a platinum recording artist. And Franz Wisner uh, is a best-selling author. Uh, I mean, just a, a, I mean, how, who can ask for better babysitters? Although I do have a good friend who was babysat by DJ Shadow, another famous uh, Davis product. So, uh, you know, we uh, famous babysitters, I guess, happen in this town. But, um, and, uh, you know, I've seen the community. Uh, 
um, grow in every sense of the word. Certainly, uh, you know, I grew up in, in, in North Davis, north of Covell, and I remember when I was a little kid, I was pretty much at the northern border of town, and, and, and that was before North Star came in, and so we would play out in those empty fields and stuff, but also um, uh, grow in, in the more um, amorphous sense in that it's, uh, you, you know, the city mature, cities mature as I matured, and, it, and it's been fascinating to watch and be a part of it and sort of come of age in, uh, in this community. I mean, we, the things that we have in this community, the schools, of course, and my dad was always a, uh, he was a businessman first and always a very conservative guy politically, didn't really like uh, um, taxes, didn't really like big government operations, uh, but he'd be the first to tell you that there's one reason and one reason only that uh, folks will pay twice per square foot for a house in Davis uh, that they would in any other town, uh, and it's the schools. And so um, you know, I'm a product of the Davis schools. Um, I went to North Davis Elementary, where my uh, where my stepson Mauricio now goes. Uh, went to Emerson, and then the high school. And I was student body president at those uh, at those latter two. Um, and uh, really, um, you know, the types of things that I was involved in uh, in junior high and high school. Certainly, looking back, they seem pretty trivial, right? I, you know, the, the student government deals with uh, dances and events and things like that. This is not the fate of the world. But at the same time, um, the passions uh, at, around the table when you're deciding about these things are no less intense than perhaps the passions at the city council meeting or at a commission meeting or something like that. And, and I've been a, a part of those organizations uh, and, and leading those organizations for the most of my life. Um, uh, and I would actually say beyond any of the student leadership stuff that I did in high school, it was uh, peer helping or peer counseling that I did in junior high and high school that, um, <clears throat> that was really the training because those, we got trained. We, we had retreat and specific training about uh, conflict resolution, mediation, and most importantly, listening skills. And it's those, it's that training that I draw back, draw from um, in anything that I do now, uh, whether it's leading a nonprofit board or whether it's um, doing policy making on the commission level or, or hopefully someday on the city council level or um, even within uh, my family or group of friends is these, the ability to listen, to actively listen, and to, to take um, thoughts and ideas and, and to, to synthesize them into workable solutions is, it's the name of the game. And I actually, the Davis schools and my experience at the Davis schools helped teach me those types of skills. So talk about your family. Talk about your new family. Sure. So uh, I uh, married a Davis girl, uh, which is, should surprise nobody. Uh, Nicole Mosley uh, was her maiden name, Nicole Arnold now. Um, she uh, actually moved around a lot when she was a kid, uh, was born in Sacramento, spent some of her life in, uh, in Texas, uh, and then um, moved to Davis uh, when she was in uh, high school. And, uh, and we met and f fell in love and, uh, and got married uh, in 2013. And uh, we've since had two uh, young children. Uh, um, uh, Sonia uh, was born in uh, 2014 in June and, and uh, Dougie uh, was born uh, just about uh, not quite four months ago in uh, November of 2015. And uh, both Sonia and Dougie are, uh, are named after um, parents of ours who have passed away, my, uh, my wife's mom. I never got to know Sonia. Um, uh, passed away, died of breast cancer um, in 2005. And, uh, and we honored her as best we could with, uh, with naming our little daughter after her. And then 
of course. Uh, um, we knew we were having a, a son and in fact had intended to name him uh, after my dad, um, but unfortunately they never got to meet each other. Next time. Sure. So, um, of the groups that you've been involved in, there are several, I, I guess there's one other thing first. You went away to college. Yeah, uh, the U of O, go Ducks. So, talk about what you just said. So, uh, uh, yeah, that's the only uh, time that I've ever lived outside of Davis was, in U was living in Eugene, Oregon. Uh, uh, went to the U of O, uh, was there at a very interesting time. That's Oregon time. for those yeah, of you. Yeah, U of O, Oregon in Eugene. Um, was there for both a, a very interesting time uh, at the university, uh, an interesting time in, in our world. Um, uh, when I got there, uh, Oregon uh, was sort of the, they weren't the doormat of the Pac-10 as it was um, in football. Uh, they had gone to one Rose Bowl a few years earlier in 1994, but they were never really consistently going to beat, you know, USC or Washington. And then by the time I left the U of O, they were a national powerhouse. And, I, and so I was there and actually had a front row seat to uh, this transition, uh, mostly um, it was uh, uh, the philanthropy of uh, Phil Knight, the founder yeah. of Nike, who's a, an Oregon alumnus, and uh, he built uh, and, and led the philanthropic effort to build the uh, new football stadium as well as locker rooms and practice facility and all kinds of things. And, um, his giving to the university is certainly not limited to athletics. Uh, the the um, library is named after him, and and uh, and some other things. Um, but uh, in 2002, uh, Oregon finished the season. It was a 2001 football season, and finished the season ranked second in the nation. And I was uh, at the time the. Uh, uh, assistant news director at the campus radio station, KWVA, uh, the Willamette Valley Alternative. And, um, and so it was from 2001 to 2003 that I held that position. And, and um, part of that was, um, was doing some work with sports. I was part of a sports talk show um, called Qu Quack Smack. Uh, I didn't name it, uh, <laughs> but uh, did a, we did a sports talk show, and so I, I interviewed players and coaches, and I was at their practice and their spring game, and um, when the new stadium was being, uh, the new addition to the stadium was being built, I um, got to do a hard hat tour. Um, so I mean, I really got to see up close and personal uh, um, this transition that the that the university made from uh, to really putting its uh, best webbed foot forward in in terms of national athletic prominence. That was a joke. I mean, the <laughs> barely. The, it was barely the, a the joke. Jokes. Yeah. The deck jokes. The deck jokes. And so, um, but but uh, like I also said, uh, it was a very interesting time uh, for our country. Um, I was at the U of O uh, when September 11th uh, took place, um, and I uh, was not working at the radio station at that time, but it was just a couple of months later at the beginning of December 2001 that I, um, that I started this gig um, writing uh, the headlines, as a, you know, basically writing the script for this, this news broadcast that was delivered four days a week. Um, we would follow... Um, Oh, what's it called? I'll have to remember what it is. But anyway, we 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 had a syndicated show that we would play beforehand, uh, and then we we did our live uh, news broadcast, and um, it was uh, I'll, I'll very clearly remember that it was it was the axis of evil speech was right around the time that I um, that I was uh, um, beginning my brief tenure uh, in the news department there. And so that entire time from that period all the way up to the lead up and execution of the uh, war in Iraq, 
I was delivering the news every day. And it was just, I mean, fascinating and edifying and, and, um, and formative for, for, for my thought because you, you really see, um, oh, how to do this in a kind way. You saw times when um, what was being said one day was possibly inconsistent with, uh, with both the evidence but also with what was being said uh, a few months earlier. And I had happened to write the news broadcast those previous months. And I said, well, wait a minute, that's not what you said. So anyway, a formative time, I think, in our nation's history, but also certainly in my uh, um, lifetime of political thought. I, I want to insert the punchline that you're discreetly leaving out, which is that you're now a Democrat. <laughs> Is, yeah, is that fair? That's oh, well, it's definitely. I have no choice but to but to say that I'm a Democrat now. I serve on the uh, I serve on the, both the Davis Democratic Club and the uh, Yolo County Democratic Central Committee uh, proudly. I'm a proud Democrat. Absolutely. Um, uh, but I'm, like I'm I, just saying, but like I said, my uh, upbringing was uh, not in a Democratic household. Uh, in fact. Um, my dad used to say we'd get to hotel rooms and, you know, you're a kid and you jump right on the bed. And, and he said, don't, don't jump on that comforter. Democrats might have been on there. <laughs> so Democrat was more or less a pejorative uh, when I was growing up. And, and uh, I was somebody who paid uh, very close attention to politics, even at a really young age. I remember when Reagan was president. I remember the 88 uh, election. Uh, and how happy my family was that uh, that George Bush won, and then I very distinctly remember, uh, and was not involved in the election, but but uh, I was in eighth grade in 1992, uh, when uh, President Bush was running for re-election, and obviously uh, uh, Bill Clinton won that election, and that was the Ross Perot election, um, and I was the only one in my eighth grade social studies class that was for Bush. It was everybody for Clinton and then a few uh, for Perot and then me. And so, I mean, I was... Uh, and yet you were student body president. And yet I was student body president and, uh, um, and everybody liked, uh, you know, I, uh, I think I did an okay job expressing myself. I, we did a like a, it wasn't a debate, it was more like a presentation of, of your you know, uh, positions on the election. And, and I think I got, if I, if memory serves, this was a long time ago now, but if memory serves that everybody disagreed with me, but said that I gave the best presentation of it. Right. So, I mean, sure. I was, I'd like to think I was thoughtful. I did. Um, so I, um, uh, was a young Republican, small, small Y as in never really officially a part of any, um, group, but, but, Self identified, identified myself identified as a Republican and and um, I think in the 2000 election um, I didn't at the time um, recognize the uh, the importance of that election I think a lot of people in this country uh, um, especially young people didn't recognize how important that election was and they thought oh here's a couple of jokesters how do you how do you support either Gore or Bush the you know Gore is really boring but Bush is obviously you know kind of silly how do you take him seriously um, and I uh, and I was one of those folks that didn't understand the consequences and then um, September 11th happened uh, the war in Iraq and the lead up happened um, and by that time, I was a Democrat, and I haven't looked back since because, um, well, I don't want to get too political, but uh, um, recent events can only uh, solidify that. Uh, the, I think even the Republicans that uh, my dad grew up liking and that I even grew up respecting and admiring right. um, wouldn't recognize the party now. Reagan would not recognize the party. I think that's a fair assessment. Um, in in the time we have remaining, let's talk a little about Davis politics. Sure. The um, you're talking about reviewing the general plan. Yeah. Well, it's been. I mean, it's uh, my understanding is the general plan uh, says that it goes through 2013, so it's time. 
uh, it, the process started, as you well know, before the internet was, was invented. Uh, it, uh, so it's time uh, to review the general plan. We've been doing a lot of planning, um, uh, sort of uh, uh, planning by exemption, uh, because uh, some folks feel, and I wouldn't necessarily count myself among them, but that, that, that there are needs that our community has that the general plan may not um, be addressing or have even anticipated. And uh, um, I think it's a really valuable process that communities go through. And it's been so long since we went through that process, almost, almost 20 years, uh, that uh, I think it would be very valuable for our community to, uh, to go through this process. And, um, and the general plan and my desire to see uh, a process that updates the general plan is really one, probably the major one, but one example of, of sort of my um, platform isn't quite the right word, but um, w when, I, uh, when I announced that I was running for city council, uh, I mentioned that, uh, that of, of my three children, two are under two years old. And so they're gonna graduate from Davis High School uh, in the years 2032 and 2034, which of course sounds like science forever. fiction. It sounds like forever from now and that, and, but uh, it's, it's that timeline, that decades from now timeline through which I view anything that, come, that would come before me as a city council member. Uh, and what I mean by that is that uh, it's perfectly reasonable, certainly in times of, uh, of economic strife, that uh, decisions are made, um, that triage is, is performed. And Explain what you mean by triage. Well, uh, for example, um, and this was, uh, I'm really only uh, paraphrasing uh, uh, former city manager John Meyer from, from his report, but uh, the staffing level, just to use an example, um, throughout our city departments, um, we, we realized some budgetary savings uh, through attrition, meaning that uh, folks who retired, we just wouldn't uh, fill that position back up and, and you would get some, some savings from that. And that makes perfect sense when you're doing triage. We're fortunate that right now, that's not where we are. We're not doing triage. We haven't, I wouldn't say that we're out of the woods. We certainly have uh, plenty of uh, budgetary challenges ahead of us, but, but we're, we have a little bit of breathing room, I think is fair. And, and um, now is a good time to uh, assess whether the staffing levels that we have uh, for various city services and in various departments are at their ideal level for the services that our community um, expects and deserves. So um, that's one way in which I would really like to take the long view uh, when we're making decisions uh, as, a, as a city. And I think the, uh, city, the um, uh, general plan is uh, is sort of the best, clearest, most concrete example of a way to really involve our community members uh, in a process uh, in which we can do some real long-term planning for our community's future for the time that little Sonia and Dougie are going to be uh, cap and gown uh, at Davis High. Um, so I would really like to see that process take place. I, I don't believe I'm the only uh, candidate who's, who's made that a priority, um, but I'm excited to, to see that happen if, should I be elected. So I want to insert something here that you may or may not agree sure. with, and that is that the state constitution allows a city to become a charter city. Now, um, a quarter of the 500 cities in California are charter cities. The big cities are all charter cities, but small cities like Marysville, which has 12,000 people, Chico, Roseville, Napa, are all charter cities. So it's not a function of size. 
a charter city has a little more authority than a general law city does. That's my understanding. But my main argument is partly from what you were talking about. The general plan focuses on land use, housing, transportation. Those are the physical assets of sure. a community. When we worked on the general plan 25 years ago, I tried to get youth and seniors and art and particularly computer networking, which the internet was brand new then. Yeah. Those things got eliminated from the first draft of the general plan yeah. and never even got considered. The kind of questions about staffing are and which business, which uh, activities is the city actually responding to as opposed to they're saying they're responding, but sure. we don't really have anybody that does that. We're, we're in a very confused state now. We've had seven city managers over the last 15 years, and because of that, there's been too much triage. Now, I know what triage means, and many people here do too, sure. but I needed to know what you meant by it. Sure. And at this point, the city is under good leadership. We're, I think Dirk Brazil is doing a great job as city manager, but there's a lot of holes and there's a, a lot of skeletons in the Davis closet at this point, and we need to move forward. Sure. So I hope the city council, the next city council, will consider a charter. And that's the end of my political sermon. Sure. So you've talked about becoming the infrastructure expert on the city council. Well, I don't know if I would say expert, but advocate. Become. Sure. Sure. Okay. Be become at least the advocate. Yeah. So what do you mean by that? Well, uh, so there's a reason why my, um, my logo, my lawn signs, have the water tower as the central uh, focal point. And it's because... Uh, uh, we have some real infrastructure needs in town. Some have been addressed recently. Uh, in fact, I would say that uh, one of my proudest achievements uh, politically in Davis is uh, my work on the Measure I campaign, which, uh, which was uh, the 2013 special election to uh, approve the surface water project. And uh, uh, it was... Uh, something that needed to happen, in my opinion. I think it's the most important thing that's happened in town, um, probably in my lifetime. Uh, maybe I'll live long enough that something else will come along. But, uh, but it, it, was, it was a critical piece of infrastructure, and not just my opinion, uh, but I'm somebody, to, to paraphrase the author, Bill Bryson, um, I, uh, I, I tend to trust uh, possessors of arcane and privileged knowledge like plumbers and surgeons and, in this case, groundwater experts. Jay Lund, Shabonaglis and Schroeder, and others uh, were in unison that this was something that the city needed to address. And, um, and so as uh, um, I was able to... Uh, make my small contribution in that effort uh, by, uh, by forming and, uh, and then running the uh, Yes on Measure I campaign in 2013, which was successful and, and uh, uh, passed uh, uh, the voters. And, and uh, this summer, I believe, uh, we'll be turning the big spigot on to get this, uh, to get this surface water. So um, it's, it's things like that that give me a lot of pride because they're, they're not sexy or whatever, but they are uh, the types of things that are critical to the services a city provides its citizens and, um, and that, uh, that lead to uh, quality of life in, in every way. So right now, uh, for example, uh, the, the poor state of our roads and, and other um, transportation infrastructure like bike paths and green belts uh, has, has come to, um, uh, I think the community has uh, wrapped its mind around the fact that something needs to be done and something drastic needs to be done. And the city council is to be commended uh, to committing um, uh, a, a not insignificant level of funding, I believe it's four million a year, uh, that, that they're putting toward the roads, but that still doesn't, that barely keeps us uh, above water, so to speak. 
and uh, I was an advocate for um, doing uh, some sort of a revenue measure that was specific to roads and transportation infrastructure. I think it's that important, and I think it's something uh, that that this, the community could have embraced. Not to say that there won't be an opportunity down the line, but could have embraced uh, this June because I think the the city knows how important those uh, uh, this piece of infrastructure is. As I recall, the the distinction in the the election law is if the money is for a specific purpose, it needs a majority vote. If it's not for a specific purpose, then it needs two thirds. No, I think it's the other way around. Okay. I think it's the other way around that if it's if it's earmarked for a specific purpose, it needs two thirds. Okay. And if it's a general tax, uh, it can be uh, just fifty percent plus one. Um, and uh, and also, uh, this is somewhat specific to Davis, but uh, only um, we can only and this is my understanding that we can only uh, put forward a revenue measure that's for city purposes during our um, our general municipal election which is every june of a of an every even year, year. Yeah. yeah and uh and that means that uh, our next bite at the apple is until june of 2018 so there are two uh ballot um measures that will be on the june ballot both of which uh i support and 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 so far haven't seen any real opposition to, uh, which is this transit occupancy tax, hotel tax, that raises it a pretty modest amount, I believe from 10 to 12 percent. That I, my understanding is uh, that uh, even the hoteliers in town recognize that this is a, uh, that this is a reasonable uh, revenue measure. So, um, uh, I suppose I'll be corrected if I'm wrong about that assessment. Even um, if you're not. And then the other the other tax measure that's on the June ballot uh, is um, a uh, marijuana tax that would that would tax recreational purchases of marijuana. Of course, there's no such thing as right now as a legal recreational purchase of marijuana, um, but the um, there is anticipation that that might change in November, uh, that the state might uh, go the way of, uh, of Colorado and, and Washington and legalize uh, marijuana for recreational use, which um, Davis, uh, like, like I said, wouldn't have an opportunity until 2018 to implement a tax on that. And therefore, the fear was, and I think it was a legitimate concern, that uh, in the interim year and a half, um, should any um, recreational marijuana retailers um, open up shop in town, uh, that uh, we would be seen as an extra desirable location to open them up because we would be the cheap place to go because we didn't have a municipal tax on top of anything the state was planning to do. So uh, I think there was some good um, forethought in putting that measure forward, and I also think it's probably now. Of course, the November vote to whether or not to legalize marijuana is going to be controversial, but I don't think this tax measure uh, is going to be particularly controversial. I think everybody knows that uh, should this pass, uh, Davis ought to uh, take full financial advantage of of that. Well, time will tell. Sure. So Davis has uh, a confused relationship with the university. Sure. We, we have a complicated relationship with the county. Yeah. Talk about the city's relationships with other institutions. Well, I think um, most large entities have complicated relationships with other large entities. I don't think that's uh, unique. Um, there's even, the, of course, the the um, the phrase town gown relationships, which are not unique to Davis. I'm sure Eugene, Oregon experiences. I'm sure Ann Arbor and Alexandria and and Chapel Hill all have uh, um, uh, ups and downs in their relationships between the city and the and the university. But um, uh, these these borders between UC Davis and the city of Davis are invisible to the naked eye. Only you and I know where one stops and the other begins. 
And more to the point, when you're a professor living in town or working at the university and going and grabbing lunch, or you're a student who likely lives in the city and goes to school at the university, the borders are unimportant and indistinguishable. Um, and, of course, Davis wouldn't be Davis. We would be another stop on I-80 uh, were it not for, for UCD. Um, I think the most, <laughs> I was thinking about this the other day, the most important thing, decision that's ever been made that affected the city of Davis, I think, would be the UC Regents deciding to put the university farm here. I think that's that would be in my that would be in anyone's top five at least and uh, and so we are in most every way blessed by having this incredible institution right in the middle of town essentially but right in, right at our right next door um, we have opportunities that most communities of our size don't have whether it's uh, uh, educational opportunities, of course, um, but also um, entrepreneurial opportunities, uh, opportunities for enlightenment and entertainment and engagement. Um, it's not uh, it's not uh, zero percent why our school system is what it is. It's because we have folks who are connected to the university who are also connected to our school system. If, if you want to learn in school, half of yeah. what you learn is from the other kids yeah. in the school. Yeah. If you have kids from foreign countries in your school, which all the Davis schools have, sure. you're going to learn about other countries sure. just by talking about where yeah. kids come from. Or kids who grew up with an inordinate knowledge of biology or medicine uh, especially or biology. physics or anything, right? I mean, we benefit in so many ways that, that, that this or any show doesn't have adequate time to address by having the university here. And I think it's very important that any conversations that are had either within our community or between the two entities recognize that fact. Uh, that, um, that said, um, there are challenges presented by having a college in your town. Um, all kinds of, of, uh, of, of, of uses of our community that are not what our community chose as, to be the use, uh, right? You got college kids that come up, and I sometimes compare uh, uh, a college town, at least in the way that, uh, that, that the undergrads treat it. It's kind of like a motel room. You come in, and you mess up the place, and then you leave, and somebody else has to clean it up, and so that happens. Um, uh, more acutely, we do have um, a really strained um, housing market in town, and that's particularly acute uh, with regard to rental housing. There's uh, um, this incredibly small vacancy rate, which is far less than 1%. I think it's 0.2% or something. So essentially a zero vacancy rate, which has um, all kinds of negative consequences um, uh, not just to renters or potential renters, but to everyone in town because you end up uh, seeing these mini dorms pop up in neighborhoods which have all kinds of negative consequences. Um, you, you see um, a desire to, uh, to build more um, rental housing than perhaps the community it would be welcoming of. Uh, there's a real uh, discussion going on right now uh, that that says that uh, that the university is is not uh, pulling its own weight or doing its fair share, however you want to describe it, of the housing, which um, I think is, uh, you know, I'm not somebody who's prone to hyperbole, but I think that that's a fair assessment to say that the university is falling short of its its own pledged. Uh, goals Commitment. and commitments uh, to uh, to house a certain percentage of students. Um, there's an MOU from the late 90s that uh, that said that the university would would house 25 percent of its students, and it's not. It's at a 20 or something, so it's not far off, but it's it's not significant. But also the um, and I'll, I'm sure I'll butcher the name, but the uh, housing for the 21st century, I think, was the was the um, uh, document that was produced by the University of California at large, but that it had a goal of uh, of 38 percent 
of housing um, uh, to be on campus. And of course, UCD is nowhere near that. So uh, there are certainly some that, that suggest that, um, that the city ought not address this issue until the university addresses this issue. Um, that's a reasonable response, however, uh, unfortunately, it doesn't, it, it, it ends up kicking the can down the road because we have serious things happening in town that are a result of this um, minuscule vacancy rate. And what do we do in the meantime? Uh, pointing fingers, uh, the blame game is not going to, uh, is not going to house folks. Well, you know, there's lots of issues. You're going to sure. have lots of time to talk about yeah. it. I want to thank you for being on our show. Thank you, John. It was a pleasure. For sure. This is what's going on. Thanks for watching. Good evening.